I don't know what it's going to do over the next three months, but yeah, I'm bullish with say a two year view or a five year view or you know potentially a ten year view. I you know, I went through a long phase where I was you know pretty skeptical on the asset. I was like, well, what if another currency is going to be better, or what if the whole what if the whole space gets so diluted? Um, but once I saw the network effects really form, once I delved into the technology and why it's designed a certain way. Um, Ever since, ever since really early 2020, I've been pretty structurally bullish on it, and and that really continues to be the case. Uh, you know, over four years later, investment strategist and macro analyst Lynn Alden is widely respected in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency community. She is known not only for her brilliant grasp of macroeconomic issues and how they affect asset prices and the overall economy, but also for her ability to present these complex issues in simple, easily understandable terms. With a unique background in both finance and engineering, Alden's deep understanding and appreciation of Bitcoin and blockchain technology are evident in every tweet, article, and interview she shares. Alden's insights into the global macro environment are further demonstrated in her 2023 book, Broken Money, Why Our Financial System is Failing Us and How We Can Make It Better. In this book, she delves into the dysfunctional state of the global financial system, explaining how it impoverishes billions while rapidly enriching the top 1%. Despite the modern era's energy abundance and technological advancements that have significantly improved our lives, Alden argues that our monetary system remains outdated and problematic. The book's back cover describes the global financial system as being akin to a barter system, with over 160 different currencies each holding a local monopoly over its jurisdiction. Most of these currencies rapidly devalue over time and have little acceptance outside their own borders, creating various cross-border frictions, bottlenecks, and currency conversions. According to Alden, being born in the wrong country makes saving money harder than it needs to be. Alden argues that while the US dollar and other major currencies still hold significant value compared to weaker currencies, these weaker currencies will eventually collapse, and today's strong currencies will become the weaker currencies of tomorrow. In such a scenario, the US dollar might follow a similar fate to the Venezuelan Bolivar or the Lebanese pound. This is why sound money advocates like Alden believe it's time to overhaul our outdated monetary system. They propose moving away from a debt-based, inflation-prone system to one that emphasizes scarcity, deflation, decentralization, and seamless payments through a robust digital network. Bitcoin, of course, checks all these boxes. With Bitcoin's rising popularity worldwide and the current gloomy macroeconomic picture, Alden believes that the United States and the rest of the world... So we have this kind of two or three tier uh, centralized money system. And the challenge there, so, you know, in the US, at least for the past, half century, we've had it pretty good. Our currency loses value slowly, and we have plenty of investment vehicles to save into. Whereas, for example, when you look at a, at a country like Egypt, um, they don't have the S&P 500. They don't have, you know, the, their, their stock market's not a reliable investment, kind of a, a wealth building vehicle. They've got real estate, um, but real estate's, of course, illiquid. So there's all sorts of downsides with that. They can't obviously invest in their own currency in any full meaningful amounts because you've got an average of double digit inflation over a 50 year period. And so what things like Bitcoin and stable coins do, a stable coin is when a when an entity holds dollars or things like T-bills, for example, uh, you can wire them money. Uh, they will then give you tokens that are redeemable, at least by large entities, for those dollars. Uh, and so they're basically like banknotes um, in digital form. And then uh, even smaller entities that don't have the right to redeem them, they can still trade them around. And the the main uh, ability there is that it allows countries that have historically had a heart that desired dollars because they wanted some stable currency that's more stable than their currency, but doesn't have the volatility of gold or Bitcoin or something like that. Um, it allows them to access dollars more easily and in more digital form as long as they have a smartphone. And so they're very popular in Argentina, they're very popular in Lebanon, they're very popular in Nigeria. We live in a world where there's 160 currencies, more or less. Um, they're all kind of central monopolies. So if you're in Nigeria, you've got to trust the Nigerian central bank and the Nigerian government and how they're going to manage their currency. Um, the borders are fairly tightly controlled, which is, you know, you can only bring so much value in or out of an airport. Uh, bank transfers are are quite controlled and often done at artificial exchange rates that differ wildly from what the actual kind of market rate for that currency is. And what stable coins and Bitcoin do is, you know, if 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 there's a Nigerian graphic designer and she holds up a QR code on a video call, I can pay her in whatever money she wants. She could ask for Bitcoin, she could ask for dollar stable coins, and it goes to her around her local banking system. 
Um, and she's able to then use that peer to peer. She can bring it with her wherever she goes if she ever leaves Nigeria. Um, and she basically has more choice over what money she uses outside of her currency monopoly. Bitcoin is the fully decentralized, you know, fully scarce version of that. It's the one that's not, there's no central hub. The thing you have to deal with is that higher volatility and the uncertainty of what it would be worth in, say, any given one or two year period. Whereas stable coins, the downside is that they are fully centralized. Um, there's some entity that's holding the the assets, and you have to trust them. You also have to trust their ability to operate in a regulatory environment. Um, but the way I would phrase it is they kind of serve as offshore bank accounts for the working and middle class rather than just the wealthy. They kind of just compress the overhead of running one of those systems where if you're in Argentina, you might not trust your your own uh, government's ability to run the currency. You might not trust the banks because in the past, you know, even if you store dollars in them, they can get confiscated away. But they say, well, you know, for small amounts of working capital, I'll trust this offshore entity. What I don't see, however, is how Bitcoin could serve any real use case for an American today. Sure. So one of the attributes of money, it is it's that which you hold, even if you don't intend to consume it yourself. Uh, that's kind of historically where money kind of came from. And so, for example, if we hold a gold coin, we're not necessarily intending to melt it down into jewelry or industrial use anytime soon, but we're kind of holding it knowing that it's a useful thing that other people use. Store of value. Store of value. And as an American, at, to your point, we, we generally don't find ourselves troubled for payments or, or even troubled for savings. We have no shortage of savings vehicles that are reliable. Um, but if you kind of view it as something that could be useful for billions of people around the world, something like half the world lives under shades of authoritarianism, um, half the world lives under kind of persistent double-digit inflation and multiple, you know, hyperinflations within our lifetime. Um, Bitcoin is something that Americans often treat more as that investment. And it's one that happens to have outperformed the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, almost everything other than NVIDIA um, over, you know, three, five, 10 year period. So for us in, in, in America and in Europe, it's often seen as an investment, uh, which I think makes sense. But in say Africa, where there's roughly 40 currencies or Latin America where there's roughly 30 currencies and every one of those currency borders is a friction. Uh, most of those currencies are undesirable to hold. It's something that's useful to them and that therefore it is an investment for people that kind of understand that there is a use case even if the use case doesn't apply to them. I do think that we are running this more structurally high inflation because of the things we talked about earlier in this, in this discussion. Um, but that doesn't mean they have to happen super quickly. It doesn't mean that things have to end. Um, you know, if you kind of do the rough math, I mean, C Congressional Budget Office expects uh, 20 trillion in net treasuries to be issued over the next 10 years. They also assume no recessions. Uh, so if there's recessions, that number is probably going to be higher. They generally undershoot the numbers. So let, but let's say conservatively, 20 trillion in treasuries are going to be issued. If you look at how much, you know, gold's going to be mined over the next 10 years, at current prices, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 2.5 trillion. And the amount of Bitcoin that's going to be created at current prices is something like 70 billion. Now, of course, gold and Bitcoin can change in price to accommodate more inflows if people want to put more money into them. But the point is basically, if you're just kind of saying, what do I want to own that's pretty scarce? Uh, obviously, good equities um, are one of the options. Uh, good real estate can be one of the options. Art is historically one of the options, especially for wealthy investors, but also Bitcoin is because it's it's liquid, it's fungible, it's portable, and it's it's got a lower kind of new supply growth rate than other a number of other kind of liquid investments. So I think from an American perspective, it's often viewed as, as an investment, whereas in other countries, it, it could be viewed as a lifeline. I don't know what it's going to do over the next three months, but yeah, I'm bullish with say a two-year view or a five-year view or you know potentially a ten-year view. I you know, I went through a long phase where I was, you know, pretty skeptical on the asset. I was like, well, what if another currency is going to be better, or what if the whole what if the whole space gets so diluted? Um, but once I saw the network effects really form, once I delved into the technology and why it's designed a certain way. Um, Ever since, ever since really early 2020, I've been pretty structurally bullish on it, and and that really continues to be the case, uh, you know, over four years later.